Good morning and welcome to Engage Online. We are so happy to have you here with us today. My name is Kelly. And my name is Alex. We at Engage Online have a deep desire to engage God, people, and culture and to launch innovative reconcilers that establish expressions that add value and meet the needs both locally and globally. Um, if you want to know our hearts a little bit better um, and be a part of what God is doing here, we would love it if you guys would fill out a Connect card and join a serve team. And to find the link for both of those things, <laughs> you can go to engagechallahassee.com forward slash home. Yes, and as usual, don't forget to drop your name and the place you're coming at us live from. We know so many of you are joining us from both within and outside of the U.S., which is absolutely amazing. We would just love to be able to connect with you and serve alongside you in the place, space, and season that God has <laughs> called you to right now. So whether you're coming at us live from Florida, Tennessee, Alabama, Puerto Rico, Colombia, anywhere in this whole wide world, drop it in the chat. We would love to hear from you. Yes, and whether you're joining us from any of those amazing places or... <laughs> Um, whether you're a local, whether in Tallahassee or Florida, we would love to invite you guys to the second round of the Nehemiah Institute. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, the Nehemiah Institute starts on June 1st. Um, and y'all, yeah, both me and Kelly took the Nehemiah Institute or went through it. Um, and we could both attest to how life changing it was in the way that it helped equip us to know and tell the story of God, grow in self awareness, grow in empathy, um, have a deeper understanding of our purpose and also just know better about how theology and work can coexist. Um, so spots are filling up quickly. So if you want to register, I would do so ASAP. And to do that, you can go to engagedalhassie.com forward slash home to find the registration link there. And now let's get ready to enter a time of prayer and worship. Yeah, grab your friends, grab your family, silence your cell phones. I'm going to pray for us real quick. God, thank you so much for who you are. Um, God, thank you. Um, that you are a God who we could come close to and have a relationship with. God, um, thank you that you are present in every season of our lives, God. Um, God, thank you that you direct us in every season of our lives, God. Um, God, I pray that you um, would get our hearts ready as we enter into worship, God. Um, thank you for the sermon that we are about to listen to today. God, I pray that we would um, get something out of this um, tonight or this morning. <laughs> in your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, we want nothing else for you. Oh, hey, mm -hmm. nothing else for you. Caught up in your presence. I just want to sit here at your feet. I'm caught up in this holy moment. I never want to leave. Do I'm not here for blessings. Oh, Jesus, you don't. I'm sorry when I've just gone through the motions. I'm sorry when I just sang another song to take me back to where we started. I opened up my heart to you. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I've come with my agenda, I'm sorry, when I forgot that you're enough to take me back to where we started, I open up my heart. 
nothing else and nothing else nothing else will do I just want you and nothing else and nothing else nothing else will do I just want Engage Church. My name is Brent Gerard. I'm the lead pastor at In Focus Church in Evans, Georgia, and it's my privilege and honor to be able to preach and to teach today as we continue in the series that you are in about seasons. And I want to talk a little bit today about the truth of living in the season of suffering. The difficulty of going through that season that all of us will encounter. This message is entitled, Praying in a Minor Key. Let's talk about pain. Now, uh, with no reference to Clubber Lang, who said that he was predicting pain, we actually can predict pain in this life. It's something we all have to go through. It comes in many forms. No matter how small or monumental, sorrow will creep into our lives. Loneliness, sickness, unfulfilled longings, an abusive boss, lost friendship, financial hardship, ongoing conflict in your marriage, infertility, terminal illness, adultery, miscarriages, a failed adoption, a death of a loved one, a wayward child, relational dysfunction, racism, hatred, and on and on and on. Pain and sorrow are an unwelcome part of the normal life here on earth. And the longer we live, the more pain we see, the more sorrow we have to deal with. But how we process it and how we deal with it have become a source of debate. I want to talk about how we should biblically deal with walking through suffering, pain, and sorrow. Maybe you're wondering what these uh, two stools are doing up here behind me. Maybe you're not. But I want to consider that, that one of them represents where God would sit. Now, obviously, we can't confine God to a a, a seat, but just for argument's sake, let's say God is sitting in one of them, and, and the other one is reserved for you and me, or any of us for that matter. 
Let's consider that the, the one that God sits in, and we'll say it's to my right, in this particular area, this particular seat, this location is where God's word uh, is, where he is, the fullness of joy, eternal pleasures evermore, uh, rest, peace, perfect love, and, and his presence. That's there. The fulfillment of all of his promises. Over here to my left would be you or me. And life's not easy right now. As a matter of fact, it's, it's difficult. It's a difficult season. And the gap between the pain of your life, where you might be right now, and the promises of God, where God always is in the fullness of who he is, is the difficulty and the season that you're in right now. There's a gap. So how do we close that gap to experience the presence and the promise of God, although we're going through the pain of life? That's what I want to preach about today. And I want to talk about the biblical lament, which should be used for us to flourish even in seasons of suffering. Question, who taught you to cry? Now, it's a rhetorical question, so don't hurt yourself. But have you ever thought about how you entered the world? And I, I, does it strike you as odd that nobody, no child ever entered into the world smiling and laughing? And how odd that would be to us because everybody enters into this world crying with tears. Life begins with a struggle. It's like we're protesting uh, uh, loudly that we don't want to come into this world. So this is proving that crying is natural to our humanity. But biblical lament is different. Biblical lament is altogether Christian as we affirm that the world is broken, but God is sovereign. Life is hard, but God is good. We affirm that the world, although it is broken and has been ever since sin entered the world, God will always be faithful. So to answer the question I asked a moment ago, lament is what stands in the gap between the pain of this life and the promise of God. Lament stands in the gap between the pain and the promise. And this is where we need to go and where we often do not. As a musician, as a matter of fact, I actually got my master's degree in music from Florida State University, so shout out to my Seminole music fam. I'm familiar with the difference between a major key and a, and a minor key or a major chord and a minor chord. They create an altogether different feel and sound depending on the piece that is written or sung in that minor key or that major key. And the book of Psalms is actually a book of songs, 150 of them. And one third of them are what we would call songs or prayers in a minor key. Prayers of lament are prayers or songs of a in a minor key. These are psalms of lament. And the reason biblical lament is important and necessary to the believer is it provides a pathway from heartache to hope. The space between these two stools, if you will, is the space between brokenness and God's mercy, where this minor key song is sung. And it leads us on that pathway from our heartache to our hope in Christ. So I want to cover the biblical pattern of lament, which I believe will help you navigate through the seasons of suffering and pain and difficulty that we all will go through. So with a third of the Psalms being in a minor key, why do we avoid lament in the church, generally speaking? This is where the tension in the church comes into play. And also it could be a reflection of our unbalanced affinity towards comfort and safety, security, prosperity, and triumphalism. Some might even argue that lament is a lack of faith and that we should faith up and walk in victory. But did you know that you could walk in victory without being a victim? That you could walk in victory and still walk through pain and suffering? And that's exactly what we do. Here's what I would say, as a matter of fact, that lament isn't a display of a lack of faith, but a demonstration of a maturing faith. If you have your Bible, I want to look at some different Psalms today. Let's start in Psalm 77. Verse one, and it reads this way. I cry aloud to God, aloud to God, and he will hear me. In the day of my trouble, I seek the Lord. In the night, my hand is stretched out without wearying. My soul refuses to be comforted. Let's go back to uh, this 
stool over here. Now this sounds elementary, but the first step of biblical lament is actually sitting down and crying out to God. It's actually going to the place where you meet with God, turning to him and crying out to him. And this is where we often don't go. It takes faith to pray in pain. And you might say, well, that seems elementary and easy. That's an obvious action that we turn and cry out to God. But I missed this for so long myself. It's an act of faith to open up our hearts to God and to be brutally honest to him about what's going on in our lives, even though he knows. I remember sitting with a great therapist that probably many of you know a couple of years ago and him saying to me, you did what you thought was right. Biblically speaking, even you thought what you did was right with your emotions, but what you thought was right was actually wrong and not wrong in a sinful way, but wrong in a emotionally and spiritually detrimental way. Because the option I chose was to not get in that conversation with God at all. The, the, the place that I chose to go was to avoid sitting down on this stool across from God altogether. I kind of gave God the silent treatment and just said, well, this is just normal. I'll get through it. I'll get through it on my own. I think that God would, doesn't really care about this or he really hasn't answered this. And so nothing's ever going to change. So it's pointless just to cry out to him right now. I can handle this and it'll go away eventually. And the problem is it never does. It never goes away. Let's keep reading. When I remember God, I moan. When I meditate, my spirit faints. Selah. You hold my eyelids open. I am so troubled that I cannot speak. You know what this is? This is a reminder that our prayer isn't always going to be brief and it's not always going to be quickly answered by God. We don't just get to pop our lament into the microwave with our favorite nighttime snack like popcorn, like it is for me, but we have to have God uh, there with us and we keep going back to him again and again. There may not be a quick resolution. There may not be a quick answer. We just sit down and we get in his presence. It's what I do when I often will sit at the piano at my house and I just sit down and I start somewhere, start singing, start playing. We sit down and we start crying out to God somewhere and believing that this is all I know to do right now. And one day, just think about that one day, maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, maybe not a whole lot of tomorrows, but one day, God, I know you will answer and restore and redeem and make things right, make things whole. One day, this season's going to shift and change, but we don't close the gap between the imperfect world that we live in and a loving, holy God unless we first take a seat in God's presence and cry out to him. Watch in verse seven and nine as the questions start coming. Will the Lord spurn forever and never again be favorable? Has his steadfast love forever ceased? Are his promises at an end for all time? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger shut up his compassion? Selah. This is like opening up your heartfelt journal and letting God see the questions you're embarrassed to ask him or maybe even ashamed to say. Maybe you were taught that you shouldn't or told that you couldn't talk to God this way. But praying honestly is a prayer of faith. Pain and suffering often create difficult emotions that are not based upon truth, but they are nonetheless feeling true to us. Anybody can cry. It's human, but it takes great faith to cry out to God in the pain, to lament. And in verse 10 and 12, the psalmist starts to sing, pray about God's deeds in the past. Then I said, I will appeal to this, to the years of the right hand of the Most High. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your wonders of old. I will ponder all your work and meditate on your mighty deeds. The remembering which is something that God taught, tells us to do often, like the Lord's table and everything that we do in this life is remembering the faithfulness of God. The remembering of the psalmist right now is the basis of his faith in the Most High. He goes all the way back to Abraham's encounter with God. Or the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, he talks about the mighty covenant-keeping God. That's who he's remembering, and he remembers his mighty deeds. He remembers his miracles and his works. He's remembering the faithfulness of God in the past to help him persevere in the present. 
We remember how God has done so many exploits in the past to endure right now in the present. This is Christian faith 101. Dial and repeat over and over again. Remember what you've done, God, so I can stand firm. This begins a shift in our prayer, if you will. This begins a closing of the gap as we begin to move a little bit closer to God in our prayers. God hasn't moved away from us. It's us that's moved away from him. So we begin to draw closer to him and the tension of a good God and the reality of our painful circumstances in a difficult season begin to bring us closer to him. Lament is the opportunity to remind our hearts who God is and who he's always been, and that is faithful. And that while we're still in the pain, while we're still in the difficulty, while we're still in the suffering, we remind our hearts what we know to be true, that God is faithful and good and loving. Lament is the song that weeping people sing while they're walking through the valley, even the valley of the shadow of death. Next, what we do in a lament is we bring our complaint We cry out to God and we bring our complaint. And this is where it gets weird. Complaining to God, that doesn't seem right. It's probably why most people avoid it altogether and never actually do what the Bible gives us latitude to do in prayer. But the Bible is full of complaints. Lamentations is a whole book of them. And since it was set to music in the Psalms in a minor key, and it was sung by a whole congregation of people at the church service, if you will, I'm going to go out on a limb and say it probably isn't something sinful. It's something that God invites us to do as those who honestly bring our hearts to him and worship him. Now understand, we're not talking about unbridled anger. I'm not talking about complaining for complaining's sake. I'm talking about biblical complaining, about suffering and pain, where we're sad, afraid, frustrated, confused. Yes, maybe we are angry, but our complaint is that with hope. We complain on the basis of our strong belief that God is good, he's sovereign, and more than able to fulfill every promise that he has made in his word. Lament is the language of exiles who believe in God's sovereignty and goodness but live in a world of pain and tragedy. That's what we are, my friends. I know you at Engaged Church know the word exiles. Well, that is a biblical understanding of what we are. A lament honestly and explicitly names a situation or a circumstance that is painful, wrong, or unjust, meaning a circumstance that does not align with God's character and therefore does not make sense within God's kingdom because it doesn't. This isn't our final destination. Look at Psalm 10. Why, O Lord, do you stand far away? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? The psalmist in this psalm is like, why in the world are you way over there, God? It'd be like this stool was pushed so far off the screen that you couldn't see it. And and we're coming and we're sitting down with God. We're like, yeah, but God, why are you way over there? And this is what the psalmist does. He even uses the name Yahweh, which is a big, powerful name of God. In essence, he's saying, you're the great I am, and I feel like you're not helping me. I feel like you're far off. And then question number two, why are you hiding from me? There's a real emotional meaning in this word hiding, such as withdrawn, ignoring, or pretending. It's like he's saying, God, you're withdrawn. You're ignoring me. You're pretending like you're God, and yet you're not doing God-like things. Now, this is where it feels wrong. Like we're telling God he isn't being very godly. But lament gives us voice to the hard questions of why it looks like pain and suffering are winning and there isn't any justice or consequences for it in this world. I know you felt that way. We've all felt that way as we look at the unjust world around us. How long, O Lord? Why have you forsaken me? I just want you to know that you're allowed to bring your questions to God. As a matter of fact, that's the best place to bring your questions is to him. He is the place for you to bring those because he's the one who has the comfort and the peace and the answers. Even if your struggle is with God himself and you're frustrated with him, God can handle that too. He's the only one who can close the gap between your pain and his promises, which are true and will come to pass. He's the only one who can apply his healing grace to your heart in a difficult season, no matter how long it's lasted. Your question can be the very thing that God uses to work in your life, to draw you closer to him and make you more like Christ. This is the blessing of suffering. If you read on in Psalm 10, you also see the importance of telling God how frustrated you are. I won't read the whole thing, but that's what he does. 
He says in his heart in verse 6, I shall not be moved throughout all generations. I shall not meet adversity. His mouth is filled with cursing and deceit and oppression. Under his tongue are mischief and iniquity. He's frustrated. It's like this guy's winning. The bad guys are winning. Where's the justice? Why does the oppressor keep getting away with everything and it looks like they're blessed and we're not? But the voicing of these frustrations is actually a pathway, as I said, to greater intimacy with God. Be specific and let it push you towards God, not away from him. And the more honest you are with God, the better, as he knows already anyway. I can remember times in my own life, in the recent past, of getting out of bed and into the shower and then just being assaulted by discouragement. But the more I voiced my frustrations, like, God, how long am I going to feel like this? How long is the pit of this that pit going to be in my stomach? How long am I going to feel like I can't really get a deep breath? And the more I voiced my frustration of what I was really feeling and what I really desperately needed from God, the more I began to feel the, the, the pain and the struggle lose its grip on my heart. When you voice your complaint and frustrations, there are also times where you begin to see things you didn't see before. Why? Because you're beginning to draw closer to God and into his presence and you begin to see things that God sees things that he's wanted you to see, things that only you would see because of what you're going through right now. Again, I want to reiterate, this isn't a time to tell God off and then just walk away. This is a time to humbly sit down, to take your seat before God, cry out to him, begin to close the gap between your pain and his promises through honestly voicing your complaints and frustrations. Pain and frustration may tempt you to be disillusioned with God, to walk away, to never sit down with him ever again, and to be honest, but lament gives you the vehicle to draw near to him. As Hebrews says, Jesus made a way, and without faith, it's impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who who seek him, Hebrews eleven six. The last part is basically saying, and faith is God's moral, moral character without which there is no faith, no reason for lament. You have to have faith. Now let's turn to Psalm 22. I told you I would just kind of be stuck in the Psalms. As you're getting there, have... I don't know if you remember back to 2017 of August, 2017, where the eclipse, the solar eclipse happened. Maybe you were the one like myself that got those goofy Devo looking glasses and, and they blacked out everything so that you could watch the solar eclipse happen. We all got those glasses or maybe you didn't, but I did. And we watched it and we watched this total eclipse happen in the middle of the day. But as we all know, the sun didn't disappear. It didn't go away. It just began to be overshadowed powerfully. The next step in our lament has similarities as we boldly ask God to help. So watch this, as we confidently call upon God to act in accordance with his character and his word, there begins to be a shift from our complaints and our questions of why and how long to boldly asking God to help us based on who he is and what he has done in the past and what he has promised to do. Much like the solar eclipse, the whys and the pain are not necessarily answered. They don't necessarily go away, but they slowly become eclipsed by God who is and always has been faithful and will do all that he has promised to do. Or we could say this, they become overwhelmed by his presence, overshadowed by his presence. That's where I want us to be. Let's read Psalm 22, 1. Notice we see both the crying out to God and the complaint immediately. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cried by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I find no rest. This is worship in the midst of waiting. A minor key worship song, if you will. But right after these two complaints, we see a suspended chord, which is a shift from the minor thing in my life that I'm complaining about to the major king in my life, who is Jesus. And as I shift to that major chord, King David right here is shifting his attention to who God is with two powerful words, yet you. And this yet you closes the gap even more between the complaint and the bold ask for help. So here we are getting closer and more intimate with God. We're drawing near to him. Yet you are holy and thrown on the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted. They trusted. And you delivered them. To you they cried out and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. You can begin to see the shift from me, myself, and I to you, God. You alone. 
Lifting up our eyes from ourselves and our navel gazing to God and lifting our hearts to him in worship. David repeats this pattern over the next five verses. And even in his pain, feeling like God has forsaken him, he anchors his soul to who God is and what God has done. My friends, this is the pivot point of every prayer for us. That even while your questions go unanswered, we cling to who God is and what he has done. He is holy. He is good. He is righteous. He is loving. Lament Psalms in particular anchor us to the yet you of God's character. And as we declare the character of God, we gain a greater confidence to ask boldly for his help based on who he is, not on the pain and the frustration of our moments. Yet you means I choose to allow the character of God to eclipse, to overshadow, to overwhelm the questions of my pain. Yet you reminds us that our sorrow and our suffering do not have to disappear before we ask God to help. And they are yet momentary and light compared to the the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ. The grace of lament is that it invites us to pray boldly even when we are bruised badly. So now the character of God comes to the forefront of the psalmist's mouth and his mind. And he boldly asks God to help. He's desperate for God's help. You ever notice that when you're desperate, you just pray differently? We must transition from the complaining to the asking. And I want to belabor this point a moment because some people don't want help. They just want to complain. We can become so adept and used to complaining that we're not sure how to transition to asking for and receiving help from anyone for that matter, much less God. The children of Israel became so adept at complaining in the wilderness that they became professional complainers and it kept them out of the promised land. If we're bringing our complaint to God, it's so that we can ask for his intervention, not just his ear. So that we can ask for his help, not just so that he can hear us. I just want to be heard, God. No, but do you want to be helped? Do you want to be healed? Has it become more comfortable to complain than to be healed from your pain? Psalm 22 verse 11, be not far from me for trouble is near and there's none to help. But you, O Lord, do not be far off. O you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You've rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. Nothing pushes me closer to God than my powerlessness. As I said a moment ago, don't you pray differently when you're hurting and desperate? This is the blessing, again, I'll say it, of suffering as it pushes us closer to God. And because God is so wise and our desperate requests become bold prayers of faith anchored to who we believe God to be, we begin to grow and mature. So the goal is not just to get something we need, but to rely on God exclusively. Do something, Lord. Please, I'm asking. Deliver me, O Lord. Rescue me, O God. Strengthen me, God. Remember me, O God. Have mercy on me, God. Return to us, O Lord. Restore us, O God. Teach me something in the middle of this. Vindicate your namesake, God. And maybe you can feel the confidence and the boldness of even those requests that I began to read. Why do we get to ask boldly? Because Jesus made a way. Back to Hebrews again that says now because of what Christ has done, we can enter boldly. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in what? In time of need, in a difficult season, in pain and in sorrow. Jesus was known as the man of sorrows. He knows the sorrow of injustice, hypocrisy, false accusations and assumptions, physical weakness, temptations, betrayals, feeling abandoned and forsaken. Jesus lived a life of lament. And because he understands deeply, we can now ask boldly. Don't become a professional complainer. Bring your complaint to God and boldly ask for help. Let this increase your confidence in God. Don't just complain. Bring your complaints. Leave them at the foot of the cross and begin to make the transition to asking boldly, which then leads to the final step in the lament. Choose to trust God. Lament is a means to an end. And that end is affirming our trust in God. The best worship songs that we can sing are birthed out of the desert of suffering. And that suffering refines what we trust in, how we talk about it, how we articulate it, how we sing it, how we pray it. And lament leads to this final choice to affirm our trust in God and our faith-filled worship to God. 
This is also why it's not something you can just check off your list. It's something that you begin to do daily as you draw near to God, knee to knee, face to face, to love him and to offer faith-filled worship to him as you affirm your trust in him. Lament leads to the final choice to affirm our trust in God through faith-filled worship. This is why this is not something, again, that we just say, well, I'm done with that. That was a good lesson. Thank you for teaching that. No, this should be something that you add to the lexicon of your prayer and worship for the rest of your life. Lament is the ability to endure, the encouragement to persevere. It's the song between the now of our pain and our suffering and the not yet of the victory that Christ has won on the cross that will be culminated completely when he returns. It stands between your current pain and reality and your burning hope for things yet unseen, things yet to come. Our final psalm, if you will, in Psalm 13, and what we see is lament leads to faith-filled worship. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemies say I have prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. We saw the yet you earlier, but now we see but God. Another conjunction that makes the shift the shift of just complaining to that of trusting in God trusting in who he is affirming what he has already done trusting in what he's going to accomplish in his purposes in verse 5 and 6 we see these ways that the psalmist is affirming his trust in God they can help us as we learn to bring our laments to their necessary end as I draw this message to an end first he says I've trusted in your steadfast love that's where we tether our now to the confidence we have in God from what he's done in the past. David is connecting the painful experience to what he knows to be true about God's covenantal love. To be a Christian means trusting in what God says and who he is, what his word says, and we've come to faith that way, and now we have to live that way. Once you trusted Jesus with your life, you trusted him with your whole life and the rest of your life. Choosing to trust God in the pains of life require we reinforce what we know to be true about God. And lament reminds us that God is worthy to be trusted no matter what we're dealing with right now. Secondly, David says, my heart shall rejoice in your salvation. We affirm our trust in God by rejoicing in God's ultimate plan for redemption. I don't know how everything's going to work out, God. I don't know how this is ever going to end, God. I don't know what's going on right now, God. I just know that I trust you. I don't see or understand what you're doing, but I rejoice in the fact that one day this will all be worked out for your glory and my good because of my salvation. Jesus' crucifixion and subsequent death and resurrection showed us that God's ultimate plan for redemption will always prevail. God's eternal plans will come to pass. Promises don't end the pain, but they do give it purpose. The Apostle Paul understood this better than anybody, and he wrote it down in Romans 8, 28, a verse that many of us know very well. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose, if your heart belongs to him and you're called according to his purpose, it is all going to work out well. The last thing the psalmist affirms is, I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Now, as a musician and a worshiper, I love this closing. I love this destination, if you will. The questions have yielded to God and they've yielded to God-centered worship. Lament has the power to reorient our hearts and then we make the choice and it will be a choice to praise God anyway, despite what we're going through, that we praise him anyway. The complaints and the requests for help have reached their intended destination and that is trust in our faithful God through faith-filled worship. Worship in the waiting. It could look a little bit different for all of us. You might pray, you might sing, you might write it out in a journal. But in the end, it's the same. One that we have to continue for the rest of our lives as we press on towards God, trusting in God completely. No matter what our eyes see, this is faith in a faithful God as we affirm, we trust you, Lord. This is how we learn to sing and worship when suffering invades our lives. And it will. We learn to do this because it is how exiles like you and I make our way through this world of pain and sorrow and difficulty. While clinging to the hope of the gospel, the hope of glory that we have in Jesus, learning to lament gives us the grace, which means God empowers us to be able to trust God more. 
Lament's just another way to seek God, and I encourage you to do it. And as always, we take all of our heart, all of our cries, pain and sorrow, all of our questions and frustrations and complaints straight to the foot of the cross. This is the place where God reminds us that he has proven his love for us, that he is for us and that he's not against us. The cross reminds us that Jesus has bought the right to make things right, and he will one day. But in the meantime, lament is the way that we can celebrate this truth even through the tears while remembering that one day will be exactly as Revelation 2, 21, 4 says. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. Seasons come and go, but God remains the same. Let's worship our loving, sovereign, unchanging God even using the biblical lament to close the gap between the suffering you may be going through right now and the loving presence and the perseverance that you can find with God as you cry out in trust and faith-filled worship to him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for what you're doing in the lives of those that are watching online right now. You may be going through a very difficult season of suffering, you may be going through a very difficult season of pain. You may feel like this season has gone on and on and on. But I want you to know that God is with you. He's always been with you. It may feel like he is a long ways away when you sit down to want to talk. But it's not God that's moved. It's, it's us. It's our circumstances. It's our doubts and our fears. And I encourage you today just to make the step of faith, just to sit down in his presence to begin to pray to him, to begin to cry out and be honest with your frustrations of where you're at, the frustrations and the, and the fears that you're dealing with right now, the pain that you may be going through right now. God, just say, God, I, I don't understand, or I'm tired of this, or, or Lord, I'm just so frustrated, I'm angry. Whatever it is, he can handle it. And I pray that in that moment, as you begin to voice your complaint and your frustrations to God, that at some point you'll realize as you begin to reflect on the faithfulness of God and how much he loves you, that your eyes will be moved from where you are to where he is, that he'll begin to overshadow you and overwhelm you with his love and that you'll begin to affirm your trust in him with faith-filled worship. God, would you meet us in this place as we worship you wholeheartedly because you're worthy of it. We do trust you, God, because you're faithful. In Jesus' name. Amen.
Good morning, Engage Online. My name is Michelle, and I serve as the Expressions Architect here at Engage, and we are going to continue in our worship with an opportunity to give. Jeremiah 1.5 says, Before you saw the light of day, I had holy plans for you, a prophet to the nations. That's what I had in mind for you. In this verse, the words had in mind literally mean gave. God is saying that he had planned to give Jeremiah to the nations. Even before Jeremiah was born, he was given away, just like Jesus was. Jesus wasn't kept on display. He wasn't kept out of reach. He wasn't a trophy tucked away somewhere. He was given away on our behalf. John 3.16 tells us that when we read that God so loved the world that he gave his only son. In his book, Run With Horses, Eugene Peterson refers to giving as a style of the universe. It's woven into the fabric of existence, and if we try to live by getting instead of giving, we are actually going against the grain. It's like trying to defy the laws of gravity. Giving is what we do best. It's what we were made for. If God made us to be given away and to give, we cannot be consumers. Today, let us practice what God has placed in our DNA and in our hearts as we give of our finances. To give, please click the link in the chat or head to engagehelhasi.com forward slash home. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for the ways that you have uniquely designed us, that you have put giving inside of our hearts, that we would reflect you and reflect your image to the world around us. Today, let us give with joy and let us give in abundance, knowing that you will also be giving back to us. God, we pray blessings over what we put back in your hands, that you would do abundantly more than we ever could think, ask, or imagine. God, we love you and we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Loves getting to hear words like this morning from our guest pastor as we move forward in this sermon series on seasons. Absolutely. And as we near the end of this series, we have our assist intensive quickly approaching. So if you want to get signed up for that, you can head on over to engagetallahassee.com forward slash home and you'll find the link there. Yep. And also want to remind you guys that the Nehemiah Institute is coming up on June 1st, and to register for that, you could also head over to EngageTallahassee.com forward slash home to find the link there. Well, that's all for now, Engage Online family. We're going to hop off of here and hop onto that Zoom letout where we hope to see you. The link will be in the chat. Yep, hope to see you at the letout, but if not, until next Sunday, Engage Online. We all we got. got. <laughs>